In today's video, I'm answering this question paper, Biology 2B IGCSE Edexcel, and it's from June 2018. So as always, here's a huge passage, which I'm not going to read out loud because that'll take forever and it'd be quicker for you guys to read it. So pause the video now to read this particular article. And now we're going to start with question one. Explain how having few or no leaves helps the cacti to reduce water loss. Line five. Cacti often have few or no leaves. Okay, wow, great. I love it when they do that and it doesn't actually tell you anything. Okay, so let's try and zoom in. If they have no leaves, then remember the leaf structure, which has the waxy cuticle, then it has the upper epidermis, the palisade mesophyll, the spongy mesophyll, the lower epidermis, and then remember you have guard cells with stomata. And that's the key bit here because water loss or transpiration occurs out of the stomata. If you have fewer stomata, then you can, you'll have automatically less water loss. So we're going to say no leaves means fewer stomata, so less transpiration takes place. So just how a desert plant may benefit from having extremely long roots, line 14. Furiotophytes are plants that have adapted to very dry environments by growing extremely long roots. Again, it hasn't told us anything. So what would be the major advantage of having extremely long roots? Well, that's so that they can reach down and obtain as much water as possible from depth. You have also said it's for anchorage, which is to hold the plant down. Many desert trees or shrubs have very small leaves, lines 12 and 13. Explain why having small leaves would be a disadvantage for non-desert plants. Okay, 12 and 13. Some trees and shrubs are also adapted for life in deserts. They have very small leaves and thorns. I don't know why we constantly have to refer to this when it doesn't tell us anything. So it's saying, why don't you want to have small leaves if you're a regular plant? Well, why do plants have leaves? Well, it's so that they can carry out photosynthesis and produce glucose and have their own food. So if you had smaller leaves, then you wouldn't photosynthesize as much because there would be fewer chloroplasts. Suggest why having small leaves is less of a dis disadvantage for desert plants. Well, we know this. It's both due to decreased water loss. And really, if you're in the desert, I assume that there's an awful lot of sunlight there anyway. So photosynthesis will be taking place quite efficiently. D. Seeds remain dormant in the soil until it rains. Line 22. Describe how rain enables germination to take place. Line 22. Their heat-resistant and drought-resistant seeds then remain dormant in the soil until it rains again the following year. Okay, again, it doesn't tell us anything. So why might you need water? Well, you can answer this in lots of different ways. Potentially, it could help the seed coat to split. Water also helps to activate the enzymes, and it also helps in the digestion of starch found within the seed. Give two other conditions that are needed for germination to take place. Remember, I used the mnemonic WOW, which stands for warmth, oxygen, and water. So we know, obviously, they've mentioned water, so please don't write that again. They won't award you marks for that. You're going to say warm temperatures and oxygen. Suggest a reason why annual desert plants need to complete their reproductive cycle very quickly, lines 18 and 19. Most annual desert plants germinate only after heavy seasonal rain and then complete their reproductive cycle very quickly. They flower for a few weeks in the spring. And the obvious answer here is that it's because the water needed for germination is only available for a very short amount of time. Some plants, such as desert lily, reproduce using bulbs, lines 32 and 33. Bulbs enable reproduction. Small bulbs go on the side of the larger bulb and separate to produce new plants. Are oh, actually finally helpful. Um, so if it's grown from the same plant, then it must be asexual reproduction. So that's actually quite a useful thing they've mentioned here. So the type of reproduction here is asexual reproduction because it grows off the main plant. There's no fusion of gametes. Suggest an advantage of using this type of reproduction in the desert. Well you don't need insects or wind pollination. Name another organ used in this type of reproduction. So we probably didn't learn about bulbs when we studied asexual reproduction. We probably learnt about strawberry runners or potato tubers. So either of those would be fine. 
don't know why they've given us so many lines for that answer. Two, wastewater may contain sewage. What is meant by the term sewage? Well, it's poo, so we're going to write the fancy word for that, which is feces. Explain the consequences of sewage pollution in rivers. Well, what sort of organisms like breaking down feces? Well, that's bacteria. So bacteria numbers increase. And it's effectively the bottom end of the answer on eutrophication. So bacteria numbers increase using up the oxygen in the river by their respiration. And remember that's aerobic respiration. The water becomes anoxic, which means lack lacking in oxygen, leading to death of other aquatic organisms. The photograph shows the flower of a species of chrysanthemum plant that only grows in East Africa. Cells in these plants produce a natural pesticide called pyrethrin. Suggest why cells in these plants produce a pesticide. So what is a pesticide? Well, it's a substance which kills pests. And why would you want to kill pests? Because they would eat the plant and therefore damage it. Scientists have grown genetically modified yeast cells in fermenters to produce large quantities of pyrethrin. Explain how yeast cells can be genetically modified to produce pyrethrin. Okay, so hopefully you've learned your perfect answer for genetic modification, and it's very similar here. So in order to genetically modify the yeast cells, first of all, we need to obtain the pyrethrin gene using restriction enzymes. And then we need to insert that pyrethrin gene into a plasmid, which acts as a vector using a second enzyme known as ligase. Explain how a fermenter can be used to grow the yeast cells. Okay, so think about the fermenter. It's a contraption which you put microorganisms in and you have to keep the conditions optimal in order to make sure they reproduce as quickly as possible. So first of all, let's provide an air inlet. And we need to explain why we need this to provide oxygen for the aerobic respiration of yeast. Next up we need temperature and pH monitors to ensure that the enzymes do not denature. And to prevent that, to prevent it getting too hot, use cooling jackets which contain water. If you can remember the diagram of the fermenter, notice it has stirrers, and that's to mix the contents. And lastly, we don't want any pathogenic microorganisms grown, so we need to sterilize using steam to prevent growth of pathogens. So I've said loads there, probably like six, seven marks. But it's worth writing a nice full answer crammed full of marking points. Four, the diagram shows the flow of energy through a food chain. The numbers show the chemical energy contained in all the organisms at each trophic level in kg per meter squared per year. So we have trophic level one at the bottom. I'm going to start here because that's where most energy is. That will tend to be the producers, remember, so plants. And then we're getting to trophic level two where we can see a huge reduction in energy, then three, then four. The energy contained at each trophic level is in the form of chemical energy. The organisms at trophic level 1 are plants, which is good. I've already said that. Name two carbohydrates in plants that store chemical energy. So effectively, name two carbohydrates in plants. So starch and glucose. You could also said cellulose or maltose or fructose. The organisms at trophic level 4 are called tertiary consumers. Tertiary, so these are the secondary. These are the primary consumers. Give the name that describes the organisms at trophic level 3. So they, I've already labelled that. They would be the secondary consumers. Calculate the percentage of energy transferred from the plants to the tertiary consumers. Show your working. So we're looking at the energy transfer from the producers. So trophic level 1 to trophic level 4. 
So we want to do 21, which was trophic level 4's energy, over the producers, which was 20,810, multiplied by 100, and we can see a very small amount, only 0.1% of energy is transferred. Explain why not all the energy contained in the plants is transferred to the tertiary consumers. This is quite a nice question. So first of all, not all parts of the plant are eaten or they're indigestible. Lots of energy is lost through organisms, movement, respiration, excretion, ingestion. So excretion is removal of waste products of metabolism. Ingestion is removal of feces from the anus. So I've crammed that line before full of marking points. And that's what you need to do in order to score lots of marks. A student uses this apparatus to find the energy content of the plants. Explain how the student could use this apparatus to find the energy content of the plants. So what you're going to do is stab that plant sample on the mounted needle, light the Bunsen burner, making sure you've got a blue flame. Place a certain amount of water, let's call it 100 centimetres cubed of water, in the boiling tube. And then you're going to pop that thermometer in the boiling tube and measure the temperature increase when you burn the plant sample underneath the boiling tube. So here, so effectively your Bunsen burner goes underneath and the burning plant sample will heat the water and you can measure the change in temperature. So let's write that below. So fill the boiling tube with 100 centimetres cubed of water. Add the plant sample to the mounted needle. Burn the plant sample and hold under boiling tube. Measure the temperature of the water before and after. You could state an equation, which is energy change equals mass of water times specific heat capacity of water times its temperature change. And then lastly, because it's biology, you want to repeat and calculate an average. Five, a student investigates how light affects photosynthesis by looking at changes in carbon dioxide levels. The student uses this method. Place two centimetres cubed of orange hydrogen carbonate indicator solution in each of three test tubes A, B and C. Put a leaf in tube A and a leaf in tube B. Wrap tube B in aluminium foil. Seal all three tubes with bungs and place the tubes in a water bath for two hours. Explain the purpose of tube C. Okay, so it contains no leaf, so it's acting as a control used to prove that any changes that occur in A and B are due to the presence of a leaf. Why is it necessary to measure the temperature of the water bath? And remember the real reason we use a water bath is to control the temperature and keep it constant. So we're going to measure the temperature to make sure that the water bath is functioning correctly. Name the independent variable in this investigation. So that's the thing you change. So what have we changed? Well, we've changed the light intensity or light levels. The table shows the student's results. So in test tube A, where the leaf was in bright light, the hydrogen carbonate indicator has gone from orange to red. So we know that the plant's been photosynthesizing a lot. So it's been using lots of CO2 in its photosynthesis. So we see C decreased CO2, which has caused that indicator to go red. In B, there's aluminium foil, so no light reaches the plant. So it can't photosynthesize, it can only respire. So yellow is the resultant indicator change, and that's because of increased CO2. C is unchanged because it's in control. Explain the change in the colour of indicator in tube A. Cool, I've already described that. So we need to say that photosynthesis has taken place, and the CO2 has been used up. And this is why I like making notes to myself, because I can see the answer nice and quickly. Explain the change in colour in the indicator in tube B. So here, no photosynthesis has taken place. So respiration is taking place, which releases CO2. Suggest a different method that the student could use to show that light affects photosynthesis in leaves. In school, you should have been shown the experiment with LOD, which is pondweed. So you have water, you have a funnel 
with a test tube over the top of it. And then underneath you have the pond weed and it photosynthesizes and produces oxygen bubbles which you can count over a set amount of time. We're using it to show the light affects photosynthesis in leaves so we do need a lamp and we can hold that at different distances. So effectively we're going to describe that. So use a lamp at different distances to alter the light intensity. Count the number of oxygen bubbles over a set time period, so a minute, for example. And use aloe deer or pondweed in each experiment, making sure you use the same length each time. obviously if you use a longer pond weed more photosynthesis will take place and you'll count more bubbles the diagram shows a section through the skin name the structures labeled a b and c okay, this is a hair this is a sweat gland and here are the capillaries so a is a sweat gland so we're looking at thermoregulation here, so controlling body temperature. B is a capillary and C is a hair. Explain the changes that occur in structures B and C when a person responds to being in a cold environment. So B and C were capillaries and hairs. So remember with capillaries, if we're looking at cold, we're trying to conserve heat. So we have vasoconstriction. And with the hairs, they stand up on end. So we're going to explain all of that now. So start by saying vasoconstriction occurs which reduces the blood flow to the skin ensuring that less heat is radiated. The hairs stand on end to trap more insulating air close to the skin to prevent heat loss. Don't be tempted to write about shivering. I know it is tempting, but we can't see. We haven't been asked about the muscle. We've only been asked about C and B, so there'd be no point talking about it here. Right, I hope you found that video helpful, guys. I'll be back soon with another video, and good luck with all your revisions.